Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your goodness. And I thank you for the privilege to share from your word today. Pray, Abba, that it would be encouraging, that it would also be uh, challenging, Lord, that it would be, Father, if be from you, that it would be words that uh, we would be able to uh, receive and to, uh, to not just uh, gain more knowledge about what your word is saying necessarily, but to put it, put it to our lives, Lord, put it to our hearts, and make it, make it a part of us, Father, so that we can grow more and more into your image. Father, thank you for the word that you give us, Lord, as uh, Matt said, that we have people who've been faithful down through the years to, to, to bring your word, and we have it so readily available to us, Lord. I pray that we would be in your word regularly, Father, that we would be applying it to our lives, that we wouldn't just be filling our head with the knowledge of it only, but that we'd be applying it to, to, to our walk, to our faith walk. Thank you again for your goodness, for your blessings, privilege to share today in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the portion where Israel finally gets to the border of the promised land. They had some distractions along the way, but they finally got to the border. And when they got to the border, when they got to that point where God had been preparing them all along, all the investments that he had been putting into them, brings them to the border, and then they don't go in. And it's like, <laughs> you know, what do we do? Obviously, God is not very pleased with that scenario. And then he says to them, because you would not go in, you sent spies in for 40 days, you're going to spend a year for every day the spies were in the land. You're going to spend a year in the wilderness, 40 years. You're going to just journey through the wilderness, aimlessly through the wilderness, until the 40 years is complete. And the purpose of that is to basically everyone that's 20 years and older, give them time to die off. That's really what's going on here. In God's anger, this is what he had said to them. Turn with me, please, if you would, to, to Numbers chapter 14. In Numbers chapter 14, in verse 29 and 30, it says this. God's not very happy. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunu, Jephunah, and Joshua, the son of Nun. You shall by no means enter the land which I swore that, I would, that you would dwell in. So this is the judgment that God gave on the nation of Israel for not going into the promised land at that appointed time, at that divine time when he brought them to the border for them to claim the promised land. Forty years you're going to wander in the wilderness till everyone but Joshua and Caleb is dead and those 19 and younger. So Israel was turned back from the border to wander these 40 years. And on a sort of collision course with God, if you will, Yes, they've been some complaining from the time they left Egypt. But it seems that their complaining just really escalates from here. And God's judgment falls in very, very harsh and strong ways. You know, this, I was thinking about this whole idea. It must have been really discouraging for those who had not been part of that particular rebellion. Uh, you know, people like those under 20. They were not going to enter the promised land as young people. They would wait 40 years. Nobody younger than 39 years of age is going to go into the promised land. Joshua and Caleb, they had to wait. They were ready to go in. But they had to wait 40 years. Aaron and Moses weren't able to go in. Aaron and Moses would never go in. If they could have gone in then, Aaron and Moses would have got to go in. But the people messed it up. And then later they mess it up. 
And so it must have been very frustrating to this small group, if you would, this faithful remnant, let's call it. Because for the next 40 years, they would have to live among God's people who don't always do what they should do. Disobedience and complaining only grew more and more intense as the time of the end of the 40 years was drawing near. See, like then, God's people today are living in the last days before what we would call the millennial promised land, if you will. That millennial, that thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. We're at the end of those days. That's about to come upon the world. Do you believe that? The millennial kingdom is coming. It's here closer this week than it was last Sabbath. I don't know where near is, but it's been almost 2,000 years. Near has got to be pretty near. And so we're in that same type of scenario here. And many of God's people are not living as they should. Disobedience, complaining, and apathy. It's all around us, folks. Testing us. Trying us. Sometimes even provoking us. This is what the situation was then as well. Trying to stay faithful in a time of apostasy. That's what Joshua and Caleb were a part of. That's what those 19 and under were a part of. But that's interesting because do you remember that all of this is for our learning and for our admonition? Turn with me please to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is a reference to this very thing that's going on. The children of Israel in the wilderness, and particularly the 40 years of wandering. First Corinthians chapter 10, and beginning at verse 5, it says, but with most of them, them is Israel in the wilderness, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. You know, a lot of times we use that word and we, we usually put it into a, a sexual content. It doesn't mean that at all, necessarily. It means lusting after anything, money, uh, material things, uh, job opportunities, anything, anything that, that, would be, that would be in the way. And do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Okay, so that's talking about when they made the golden calf. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them were also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. We'll look at that in just a few minutes. Nor complain as some of them and complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all of these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the end of the ages has come. So Paul is saying here that this message, this, this, these examples, these learning, this admonition, it's been for all of God's people since these things took place. But he says especially for those at the end of the ages. It's particularly important for us as examples, as learning, as, as, as uh, for admonition for us. So he's saying there's something here in these stories, folks, that we can learn from. Very, very critical things because we're looking at two time periods, the last days. 
They were supposed to enter into the promised land that, again, if you will, that, that promised millennial kingdom. See, 40 years that Israel wandered, it would yield up many examples and things to learn from. But because of the neglect of the, what we call the Tanakh, most call the Old Testament, I believe that the church, today in particular, is missing so many things that could prepare us for our faith walk. <clears throat> you know, we've been talking all along that this whole journey has been a picture of our spiritual walk. When they were in Egypt, it's a picture when we were in our sins. We were captive in our sins. There was no one to rescue us. I mean, ourselves. We, need a, we needed a rescuer. That rescuer is Jesus Christ. That's what that's a picture of. He's the Passover lamb. His blood was poured out, put on the doorpost and lentils of our heart, that the wrath of God may pass over. That's what that's all about. When those people went through the Red Sea, it's a picture of our baptism. When we got on the other side of those waters, we saw that our enemy was destroyed. And the power of the enemy had no power over us anymore. That's what that's talking about. When he took them to Mount Sinai and he gave them his laws, that's a picture of the new covenant. His laws written on the tablet of our heart, not on the tablet of stone. And now he's gotten them to the edge of the promised land. It's a picture of a couple of things. It's a picture of the promises that God has for us in our lives to walk faithfully with him in victory over the enemy. Taking captive back land that belonged to him. But it's also a picture of the millennial kingdom. It's also a picture of God's established kingdom. And they got to that border and they didn't go in. So what's that a picture of? That's a picture of when our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was on the earth. And he said to the Jewish people, if you only knew what could bring peace. This is in Luke 19. If you only knew what could bring peace, but you've missed this hour of your visitation. In other words, your Messiah is here. And if you would have accepted me, if you would have believed in me, we would have gone on into the kingdom. But you didn't believe. Just like Israel didn't believe. They didn't go in because of unbelief. They didn't believe God. So they were sent out for 40 years to wander. Well, it's not been 40 years since our Lord and Savior was rejected by his own people. But it has been almost 40 jubilee years. And we're almost at the end of those. It would have, it, this would be the last of these. You get 20 jubilees in a thousand year period, folks, and we've been almost 2,000. So we're coming very close to the end of a 40th jubilee. We don't know the exact when it is. I believe that's why the jubilees have been lost. We don't know exactly when it is, but we know that we're getting close. And that new generation is going in. Does that mean all of those who died in the wilderness are not going to be in there in the end? No, it doesn't. But it means they didn't go in at that time. But there is a generation who will go in, a generation who will be alive when the Lord comes back. Scripture says that. Not everyone's going to be dead when the Lord returns. There's going to be a generation alive. But we're not going to pass up those who've died. They're going to be resurrected. And then we're going to be clothed with immortality. And then together, we're going to go into the millennial kingdom for a thousand years. Because there's a Sabbath year to be fulfilled yet. But that's, a, that's what this is all a picture of. That's why this is big stuff, folks. This is important stuff. But if we reject it because, well, this is Old Testament stories. It just doesn't really have any... any then we miss all of that. These stories teach us by example. And they point us to Jesus. They point us to our Savior. You see, we've got this strange idea in the church today. 
we've got this strange idea that if we've already received Christ, we don't need to be pointed to him anymore. But that's not right. We, we can still learn more about our Lord and Savior, can't we? Amen. We, we need to be pointed to him. Not for salvation. We know him in that, in that realm. But we'll spend the rest of our lives getting to know who our Savior is. And how do we know him? By the things I say? Hopefully not. But by the things that the Word of God says. The things that were pointing to him. The things that were about him. You know, you can say, well, yeah, but Art, doesn't, doesn't it say that, that the law was a tutor to bring us to Christ, and now that we've come to him, we're no longer under the tutor? Well, yeah, it says that, but it doesn't mean exactly that. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Are you still under your school teachers when you were a kid? Gary, are you still under those teachers? They come to your house and teach you every day? No, they don't, do they? You're not under them. So we're not under those old school teachers, are we? Those old school masters. But let me ask you a question. Have you chucked off everything they taught you? I hope not. <laughs> I hope you might have forgotten a lot of the things that they taught you. I have, but not willingly. See, yeah, the law was to bring us to Christ. Yes, it was pointing us to him because all of these stories that we call the law, we call the prophets, we call the Psalms, all of which he refers to in Luke chapter 24, are pointing us to him. But once we get to him, we don't trash everything that brought us to him. No, it becomes even more elevated in our lives. Because if we realize what that was trying to point us to, then we realize that the instructions that we re receive from him, living those out, make us like him. Amen. Because that's what it was pointing to. Right. The law was saying, look, do you want to see a person who embodies everything that God is trying to reveal to us? That's Jesus. That's who that is. You want to be like him? Is he our example? Do you want to walk as he walked, as John tells us, that we should walk as he walked? you want to do that? Here's all the instructions right here. This is who he was. The word of God made carnate in the flesh. You want to be like him? This is, our, this is how we do it. And through revelation of the Holy Spirit, of course. You know, we've been focusing on this fact that Torah points to Messiah, teaches about him. Throughout this whole Torah cycle, we've been doing that. And this portion has two very, very powerful lessons for us. So I want to focus on these two events in this portion that both point to the crucifixion and to the saving power of the cross. First, I want to consider what happened at this place called Meribah. All right, Israel came to the wilderness of Zin, not Sin, Zin. And what happens? Well, Miriam has just died. But the people don't have any water, and so what do they do? They complain, right? Instead of putting in an order for some fresh water, they complain. Complain against Moses and Aaron. Say, oh, you know, we should have died with the people who died. Meaning Korah and the rebellion. But you've brought us out here into this desert place now to die. And we don't have any water. And they begin to complain. And then Moses and Aaron go to the Lord and say, what do we do? And he says, take your rod. Take Aaron's rod. Gather the people to this rock, speak to the rock, and it's going to give water. So Moses and Aaron gather the whole congregation before the rock, and then Moses says, Must we provide you rebellious people with water from a rock? And he strikes the rock twice. Water flows, the people's watered, 
and everything's good, right? Everything's not good. See, God catches up with Moses and Aaron in just a few minutes and says, uh, excuse me? You were told to speak to the rock. But you smote the rock. And because of that, you and Aaron are not taking the people into the promised land. Folks, think about that. Moses, everything that poor guy has been through dealing with these people, loses it just once. In a, in a, in a, in a fit of just, just anger and, and just a few seconds of, of disobedience, God says, you two are not going into the promised land. Why? Why so such a strong chastisement? Why, if there's ever a time when it seems that God's punishment is just too far outweighed the crime, this might be pushing it in one of those areas. But if we look at four things, then we realize that Aaron, or that Aaron and Moses weren't as innocent as we might think. And that God's discipline was not excessive. I want to look at four things, especially the fourth one. But before we do that, I want to look at a parallel story of this situation. Turn with me, please, to Exodus chapter 17. You see, Moses has been in this situation before. This is shortly after they come out of Egypt, cross the waters, they're in the wilderness, and they don't have any water. Israel complains, God gives Moses these instructions. Exodus chapter 17 and verse 1, Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it that you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. Now this is just getting started, folks. This is what Moses has been dealing with all along. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod from which you struck the water and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb. And you shall strike the rock. And water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So they're there, just outside of Egypt, coming across. Moses strikes the rock. Water flows. Gives them all drink, their animals and everything. The story goes well. Everything's fine after that. Well, this is the parallel story to what happens here again later in Numbers chapter 20. See, at Meribah... Moses was told to repeat this miracle again. But with some different instructions, which he chooses to ignore. But with that said, why was God so severe in his discipline? Again, I want to look at four things. The first three I've read in the past. The fourth one, the Lord showed me. I didn't read this 
about 20 years ago, the Lord showed this to me. And I believe it's the most important reason why Moses and Aaron are not able to go into the promised land. Why the punishment was so severe. It's because the crime was so severe. First reason, Moses disobeys God. In Numbers chapter 20, let's turn back to Numbers chapter 20. Why isn't God allowing Moses to go into the promised land, him and Aaron? Because they disobeyed God. In chapter 20 and verses, verse 8, it says, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes. So Moses is given very clear <clears throat> instructions here to speak to the rock. Verse 11, Then Moses lifted his hand and he struck the rock twice with his rod. You know, this, I, this idea here of striking the rock twice most translations say twice. Does everybody say twice? Okay. In the Strong's, this could also be rendered a second time. Moses struck the rock a second time. So usually we get this picture of Moses says, do we have to bring rock water from this rock, you rebels? And bam, bam. That's the picture we get. But in reality... It could be that he just struck the rock a second time. Okay? So he disobeys the Lord. Second reason. Maybe because Aaron and Moses claimed to give water themselves. In verse 10 he says this. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and he said to them, here now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Maybe you can include God there. But Moses and Aaron are the ones standing before the people. Robbing God of glory, maybe. There's an argument that can be there. Again, these are things that I've read in the past. Number three, because Moses was in a high position. He was the highest position. And when someone in a high position disobeys, then that's a serious thing. It needs to have serious repercussions to it. Kind of like when Nadab and Abihu, remember? The priests, the, the, the high priest's sons, number, top two sons. When they did what they did, the uh, chastisement was strong. God killed them there at the altar. Because if he hadn't, then how much more would have the priests that are under them not really cared if they're doing things properly? Now Moses, who is the leader, blatantly disobeys the Lord. God says, because you spoke or acted against my word. Who's the word? That's right. Because you acted against my word. It's not a small thing, folks. But here's what I believe is the most serious crime that was committed by Moses. It was that he marred a prophetic picture of Messiah. You see, that rock that, that Moses hit, that struck, that gave water, that rock represented something. It represented Christ. Turn with me again, please, back to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Remember, in this opening of this chapter, he's talking about the children of Israel being in the wilderness. And in chapter 10 and verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you, excuse me, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers 
were led by the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses and in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. So Paul is revealing to us here that that rock that they drank from was a picture of Christ. So when Moses struck this rock back in Exodus 17, it was a picture of Christ being crucified and life-giving water flowed when that happened. But at Meribah, Moses was told to what? Speak. It's a picture of prayer, folks. The rock's been struck. Christ was crucified. He doesn't need to be crucified again. Now we just speak to the rock. Now we just pray. We intercede in that way. But instead, Moses strikes the rock a second time. A picture of Christ being crucified a second time. Thus marring this whole prophetic picture that God was trying to put forth for them. Now, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 7. And just let the scripture remind us of what it says here. Therefore he, he is Messiah. Therefore he is also able to save to the utmost of those who come to God through him. Not only is the able to the utmost, folks, there's no other way. Okay? So it's not that he's to the utmost, it's he's also no other way. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those who were high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, and then for the people's, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Folks, our Lord was offered up one time, just one time. And yet when Moses struck the rock a second time, it was a marring of that prophetic image of Messiah being crucified just once. And he was being crucified a second time. You know, when we see that Moses and Aaron marred this prophetic picture, then it becomes a little bit more clear why God was so upset. But what can we learn from this? I think we need to realize that we can't allow ourselves to become careless with our own relationship with God just because so many others around us are. Because that's what was going on with Moses. Moses has been dealing with this throughout the whole time, folks. But it seems to be intensifying now. It's like these people have recognized that they're not going in in their lifetime, and it's almost like they don't have, they don't have the gumption to carry them through, <laughs> to stay faithful. And so it's getting intense. Apathy is rising, complaining, and so forth. And Moses was letting the unfaithfulness around him affect his own actions. And a great sin was of the result. 
one that cost him the promised land. You know, the scripture doesn't say it here, but when the Lord told him that he was not going to enter into the promised land, could you imagine what went through his mind? Could you imagine the sinking feeling that he had when the Lord said, Hey, Moses, you're not going in because of what you did. Now, if Moses was the man that I believe he was, and you all know he was, not only was he heartbroken that he's not going to go in, but that he displeased the Lord, that he disobeyed him, that all of this around him got him to the, got him to the point where in a fit of anger, he greatly disobeyed the Lord. That probably tore him up more than not being able to go in. But folks, that could easily happen to us. We're living in a time now when a lot of God's people are not being real faithful to him. What's happening inside, folks? Is it causing you to just become a little bit more irritable toward God's people? Is it causing you to be just a little bit more cynical than you typically might be? Is it causing your love to grow a little colder? Because that's what the scripture warns us about. Our Lord said that in the last days, because lawlessness will increase, many's pe many people's love will grow cold. Folks, that's what this is trying to teach us. We cannot allow ourselves to grow cold to the ways of God because we see it all around us. Because if we do, ultimately it will affect us and lead us to a place of disobedience. Apathy is a powerful thing. It's a cancer. And we've got to stay on guard with it. Now Moses is going to be in the millennial kingdom, folks. He, yes, he died in the wilderness with many of these other people before going in. But he is going to be in the kingdom of God. Why do we know that? Because remember in the Mount of Transfiguration, when the disciples see just a piece of the kingdom, remember he said there are some here who will not die till they see the kingdom come. It says about six days later, James, Peter, and John were up on the mountain and they saw Jesus transformed. And who was with him? Moses and Elijah, right? And what does Peter say? Oh, Lord, it's a good thing that we're here. Let us build a tabernacle for you and for Moses and for Elijah. I don't know if they had name tags. I'm not quite sure. But he knew who they were. I think it's like in a dream when you supernaturally know who the people are. Because they're in a kingdom setting. And Moses is there. So it's not about that. It's about the idea of staying faithful to the Lord in a time when many of God's people aren't. Miriam, Aaron, and Moses, they'll die with the others in the wilderness as a lesson for these of the last days to be faithful to the end. Okay, the second powerful thing I want to look at here is this prophetic message um, prophetic picture of when Israel journeyed from Mount Hor. Aaron dies. After a little bit of mourning, doesn't take long again, folks. After a little bit of mourning for Aaron, you know, because they, they, they were so sorry that they'd picked on this guy all these years. Whatever reason they were mourn, uh, mourning for Aaron, I think they really did love him. But shortly after they're done mourning for Aaron, what do they do? They find that they, they don't have their needs met here. My mind just went blank. What did they not have? And they complained. What was it? Do you guys remember? With the brass serpent? What was it? No bread and no water. Yeah, that's right. This is where they say to, uh, to uh, Moses, see, at least, what's that? Yeah, <laughs> they 
Jesus, right? Uh, well, the one thing that's kind of interesting here is Aaron, poor Aaron's out of the picture now. And so the, who are they going to complain against now? They complain against the Lord and Moses. Aaron at least gets left out of it now. And not for a good reason, but he's left out of it. And what do they say? They say here, they say, And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food and water. And our souls loathe this worthless bread. Man, it's just getting worse and worse, folks. This is angels' food from heaven. And now they're calling this manna worthless food. It's like, you know, there were several times when the Lord said to uh, Moses, step away, get away, because I'm going to wipe them out. And I'm going to bring up a new nation through you. And Moses would always stand in the gap, wouldn't he? And say, no, Lord, you can't do that. <laughs> Not that you can't, but uh, please, you can't do that. And he would remind God of that this wouldn't be good for his name's sake. And God would repent or change his mind and not do it. But now they're complaining and even referring to the manna as worthless bread. So what happens? Numbers 21.5, what we just read, they're complaining. No water, no bread. So what happens? God sends fiery serpents. Poisonous snakes is what's going on there. God sends poisonous snakes into the camp, and those snakes start to bite the people. And many of the people die. And they start crying out to Moses, Oh, we've sinned against you and the Lord. We've complained. Please tell him to take this, take these away. Take them away. And so Moses, again, he goes and he intercedes for the people. And the Lord gives him some pretty interesting instructions. He tells him to make a brass serpent, put it on a pole, and then stand it up. And then he gives the instructions that whoever looks upon this snake will be healed. Um, the brass serpent will be healed of their snake bites. And the people, it says that to those who had been snake bitten, looked at the brass serpent and they were healed. Well, that word look there is very interesting because it doesn't just mean take a look and go, you know, because I looked at it. No, it means to gaze intently. It means to gaze intently. To look to it. Now, this isn't worship because later on they would worship the brass serpent and then it would have to be destroyed. But they were to look to it. So what's this all about? <laughs> what, what's, what's this really a big, big, powerful, prophetic picture of? Well, it's a powerful picture of this, folks. Just as the people of Israel there in the wilderness were being bit by these snakes, these poisonous snakes, snake bites that were going to be lethal. It's a picture of the fact that every one of us has been bitten by the snake. That serpent of old, the devil, Satan. We've all been bitten by him. And if we don't get the cure, the cure, you're going to die. That's right. And there is no other cure. Just like when Israel was told, you want to live from these snake bites? Look at the brass serpent that Moses is holding up. That's going to heal you. That's the cure. It's not medication. There's no, there's no salve that you're passing around. Nobody's... Nobody's doing any kind of medical things to get this taken care of. There is no cure except the brass serpent that's being held up. Folks, we've all been bitten by the snake. That one that would feed on the dust of the earth from the garden. What are we made of? Dust of the earth. 
He feeds on our carnal nature. We've all been bit. But this is a picture of Jesus Christ. And if we look to him, and not just look, but if we look to him, if we believe into him, that's the cure. That's the cure from the snake bite. And there is no other cure. And you can say, well, Art, that's really a pretty cool uh, description or a pretty cool uh, a commentary here on this story. Well, you know what, folks? It's not my commentary. That's the glorious, picture, the glorious thing about this particular one. These are what the words of our Lord and Savior himself says. He interprets the brass serpent that Moses holds up in the, in the wilderness. That heals the snake bites. He's the one who makes that interpretation. Not me. Not me. That's what's glorious about this one here. And uh, I, want to, I want to basically close out today looking at this passage. Looking at this passage of the words of our Lord giving us the commentary on what's happening here in the wilderness. Why? Because what's happening in the wilderness was for our learning and for our admonition. And it's all pointing to him. That's what's going on here. Let's let the Lord tell us that himself. Turn with me, please, to John chapter 3. This is a conversation that Jesus has with one called Nicodemus. And I'm going to close with this, with this passage here and let our Lord have the last words in our talk today. In John chapter 3, uh, chapter 3, and beginning at verse 14, the Lord speaks these very powerful words. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He's talking about himself. He's talking about himself going to the cross. That whoever believes in him or into him should not perish but have eternal life. Here's the all-knowing verse that most people know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him or into him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Why? Folks, I want to stop there for just a second. Why didn't God send his son into the world to condemn the world? <laughs> He's already condemned. Because it's already condemned. It's already condemned. It's already been bitten by the snake. But that the world through him might be saved. He who believes into him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. 